and open to the letter that Paul wrote to the first Thessalonians. I also um, encourage you to have a pen and paper and write some stuff down. Don't just let Sunday morning in the time of teaching to be uh, your weekly time of worshiping God and getting with God. This, sh- this should just be a small blip of what goes on during the week in your relationship with Him. So 1 Thessalonians, this is our fifth uh, sermon on this letter. We started verse 1 and we're going through all the verses. So before we begin, I I ask you a personal question. So this is going to be the fifth. Um, Has anything changed in your life at all since starting this book? And if the answer is no... I want you to go before the Lord and ask Him why. Because this is His Word and it doesn't return void. As Paul says, it's not empty. Uh, It accomplishes uh, God's purpose. And if it has, then I commend you to thank God and ask Him to continue to produce fruit. For why else do we come here on Sunday than to be edified and to be built up into... uh, his glorious body. Okay. First Thessalonians, we are in chapter 2. Follow along with me starting in verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 2 starting in verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this. That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. And displeased God and opposes all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But the wrath of God has come upon them at last. Paul here is continuing in his encouragement to these new Christians. Last week we talked about the metaphors that Paul uses to encourage them. The metaphor of a nursing mother and how a a nursing mother cares and nurtures and loves that infant. And also used the metaphor of an encouraging father. As he says, we encourage you and charge you to walk or live a life worthy of the calling that you have been called. He also reminded them that they didn't come with any evil motivation. There was no trickery. There was no deceit that was behind their motivation of sharing the gospel with them. At the end of verse 12, he charges them again to live their lives in a manner worthy of the new life, regenerating work of God. He reminds them that they are now part of a new kingdom. They are part of the kingdom of God there in verse 12. And now we, we move into this section that really shows us the evidence of salvation. It shows us that there is power in the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 20, write that one down. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Many, many folks call themselves Christians, but it's all talk. There's no power. There's no change in their life. There's no evidence of this powerful, almighty God that says He comes and makes all things new, makes you a new creation. Well, here Paul gives us much evidence in these first two chapters of the regenerating work of God in the Christians at 
Thessalonica, this city of 200,000 people, this city of pagan worshipers who turned from their idols to serve the one true God. So here in verse 13, he says, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, what you heard from us, you accepted it. Paul again is pointing to his pattern of what? His pattern of prayer. His pattern of thankfulness to God. His pattern is of pointing to God, saying, look what God has done. He's not, he's not constantly saying to the Thessalonians, you know, wow, you guys are awesome. Although he is encouraging them, he does use the f- familiar language of calling them brothers, including them into the family. But he's constantly thanking God for the fruit that God has produced. This pattern of prayer, of thankfulness, of the faithfulness of God. You see, God sent Paul out to a culture that was foreign to him. After Paul's conversion, when Saul of Tarsus became the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, Paul knew what the cost was going to be. He knew that his own countrymen would think that he had gone crazy and set up against him, and it may even cost him his life. But Jesus, the Messiah, sent him out anyway. And so Paul is constantly pointing back to being thankful of God's faithfulness. That same faithfulness of, I will be with you even to the end of the age. That the church will prevail against the gates of hell. That means you, the kingdom of God is taken by force. This isn't a passive thing, folks. Paul knew that. He constantly looked back and looked up to the faithfulness of God. He's thankful that these Christians, these new baby, baby infant Christians, had become imitators. Imitators of who? Well, Paul says that you became imitators of us. They became imitators of the apostles as the apostles followed and demonstrated the model of Christ. They became imitators of who? The Lord, ultimately. And in verse 14, it says that they became imitators of the churches in Judea. You see what Paul is doing here in verse 13 and 14? He's he's pointing and he's giving substance. He's giving substance to what? Well, he's giving substance of verse 3, chapter 1, that they had a work of faith, a labor of love, and a steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that? It's not just words. He's, He's giving evidence that they had become imitators of the apostles. They had become imitators of the Lord, and they had become imitators of the churches in Judea. They had a model, and they were following it. They looked like Christians. The churches looked like Christians. That's incredible. In fact, of the Thessalonians is the only one that Paul gives this charge and this exhortation to. And and for us today, 2,000 years later, they are still being held up for the faithfulness and the work of God in their lives. But he says that they became such imitators of the churches in Judea following the pattern of the Lord that their reputation was known everywhere. And you know, as a church, I've asked us, is our reputation even known here in shirts, let alone the surrounding areas? But was this the Thessalonians or was this the Holy Spirit of God? It's the Spirit of God. So what did it take to get them to do this, to to imitate the apostles? What did it take? Well, it took the message, the Word of God. And it took the receiving of this Word as it is the Word of God and not the words of men. So Paul says... You received the word of God, which you heard from us. What does this show? Well, it shows us that when Paul went on a journey, a missionary journey, he didn't just go empty-handed. He didn't just go, you know, fly by the nilly here. He had an agenda. He had a purpose, and he had ammunition, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
as the apostle says, I aimed to know nothing among you other than Christ and Him crucified. You see, Paul, it demonstrates that he trusted in the message of Christ. He didn't have to make something up. He didn't have to dumb it down. He didn't have to water it down. He didn't have to change it. He didn't have to add to it or take away from it. He came with a message to these pagan people. The same message that he preached in Athens in Acts chapter 17, that Almighty God has appointed a day in which He'll judge the whole world in righteousness. Repent, therefore, all of you, and believe the gospel that this Christ, namely from Nazareth, Jesus, was born of a virgin. That He came and He lived a sinless life that he was accused falsely. He was tried falsely and illegally. And he was placed on a wooden cross and nailed to it. And they held him up just as Moses is lifted up on a pole. The Messiah was lifted up and all who look to him will be saved. He died suffering the wrath of God on your account that he who knew no sin became sin so that you would become the righteousness of God. And he died. And three days later, he rose from the dead, triumphantly defeating death and the grave, showing that the propitiation of sin was paid in full, atoned for, completely finished. And he rose and ascended into heaven and he'll come back again. You believe that, you have eternal life. You deny that, the wrath of God remains on you. You have no other choice. There is no other name given unto men that which we might be saved other than Christ Jesus. This message is the same message that is preached today. That message comes with power. And that's what he preached to a pagan people, moon worshipers, sun worshipers, goddess worshipers. And they received it. It didn't just come as words of advice. This wasn't just a philosophy. This wasn't just some great wisdom of the day. This was the word of Almighty God. And they received the message as it was. The word received in the text here, it means to take near and dear to you and familiarize yourself to learn from it. That's what it means to receive it and draw near to it and to learn from it, to familiarize with it. The power of the gospel brought this regenerating power, as it says in verse 5 of chapter 1, with full conviction. There was power. There was evidence. There was a spark that caused a flame that could be seen. And it says throughout the land, everywhere, throughout Macedonia. Because there's power in the Word of God. There's power in the Gospel. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says, someone has said it like this, the Gospel is not the kind of message that man would invent if he could, nor is it a message that could be invented if he would. The Thessalonian Christians sensed the supernatural truthfulness of the gospel Paul preached as the Holy Spirit brought this conviction home to their hearts. When Christians share their faith, they do not merely give their particular viewpoint on life as one among endless varieties of human theories. No, they announce the divinely revealed truth and word of God. There is no other truth. There is no other way. There is no other life. And all men will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. All men everywhere will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Now, it also says here, when you look at the text in verse 13, they received it. I told you what the word meant originally. But it also says that when they heard it from them, which means Paul and his missionary contemporaries had a message, the gospel I just explained to you, they accepted it. So they received and accepted. Now you would think that that's the same word, but no, it's not. 
Why would Paul say you received and accepted? Because it's very important. The word accepted actually means accept, come along with, with pleasure and favorability. So you have this received, drawing near, familiarizing, learning, and then accepting with pleasure and favorability. This is something that you see when the gospel is preached, people are taught. There's evidence they're good soil. You remember Jesus talked about these soils. He had soil that as, as the seeds of the gospel are sown, they fall among rocky ground. Satan comes and steals it before it could even be revealed at all into their hearts, as it says in Romans, right? The spiritual things of God are spiritually discerned. There's people that hear the preaching and they're like, I don't understand a word that guy is saying. Or they'll read the Bible and they'll say, this is all Japanese to me. I don't understand any of it. Well, duh. It's only given by the Holy Spirit. What does Jesus say to the disciples who say, but who can be saved then, Jesus? And he says, with man, it's impossible. It's impossible. You can't understand this stuff. This is why Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. He can't see it. You don't recognize it because the kingdom of God comes with power, not just talk. It comes with power. So they received and they accepted and then it began to produce a work in them. Does it not say that? Accept it, not as the word of men, but as it really is, the word of God. The word of God. So how does a person grow in their faith? The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. There's power in his word. And so Paul was ecstatic about this. The word of God was changing them and changed them. So it changed them and was continuing to change them. Their behavior changed. How do we know? It says that they abandoned the idols to serve the living God. Also, they became imitators of the apostles. Paul pointed back last week, I taught you on how he said, you remember, brothers, when our, our conduct among you was blameless and righteous and you became imitators of it. So they were imitators of righteousness and holiness, which means they took that seriously. They didn't just say, oh, we're under grace, so let sin abound so grace can abound. No, that was far from them. They took holiness seriously. Why? Because they wanted to walk in a worthy manner of the calling in which God called them. So they became imitators also, not only the apostles, but of the other churches. They suffered persecution, and they didn't give up the race. That also shows the genuineness of our faith. Does not Paul say that same thing in 1 Peter? Refined by fire produces gold. We're talking about faith, trials. I mean, did I, did I say, did Paul say that in 1 Peter? No, Peter said that in 1 Peter. <laughs> Paul says that uh, uh, elsewhere. But the, the point of the fact is, is that persecution did not cause them to pull back in the race. Now remember, Jesus talked about this in the soils as well. He says, not only is there seed sown among rocky ground where Satan comes and steals it before you can understand any of it, but then there's those that receive the word of God with joy. Is it the same word for receiving? No, 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 no. See, they receive it for the wrong motive. They receive it because... Oh, I become a Christian and my, wife, my, my, my marriage is going to go wonderful? Oh, I receive it and I'm going I'm to get a, a better job and I'm going to get a, a better car and I'm going to get a house and I'm going to get... Well, give me some of that. They receive it. But when, when the thorns and the thistles begin to be there as you grow and you got people persecuting you, forget this noise... That evangelist told me I was going to get, my marriage was going to be saved, and it, it, and it fell apart. He lied to me. No, Jesus didn't lie. Jesus said that in this world you will have trouble. He, he said, take it to the bank, folks. You will have trouble. But 
Take heart, I've overcome this world. For this is not your home. You're passing through. So when this persecution came upon the Thessalonians, they didn't shrink back. Nope. They produced fruit. Therefore, proving that they were good soil, as Jesus said. Their faith was being displayed by their good works. And the Apostle Paul was so ecstatic about it. That's why he keeps writing and saying, I thank God continually. This wasn't a one-time, oh, Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you've done in in Thessalonia. No, he says continually. Now, what happens to a heart that is continually thankful? Think about that. If you're continually thankful, then where's your focus? On the faithfulness of God? On His presence? Right? On his, his uh, just displaying his glory. Huh. I wonder why the Bible says that he keeps him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. Where do a lot of our anxieties come from? When we relinquish and let go of a thankful heart. Paul didn't have that. This is a man who could be in prison. This is a man who I explained last week or the week before, I don't remember, could be stoned, right? Drug out of the city and left for dead and gets up and goes right back into the city to preach the gospel with a thankful heart. This guy was nuts. He was nuts because of the Holy Spirit. I want to be nuts like that. I don't have that all the way. I want it. Give it to me, God. But you know what? It'll cost you. It'll cost me. They received and they accepted the word of God as it was. And the word of God began a work in them. What does all of this show? It underscores the certainty of the Thessalonians' election. They were chosen by God, chapter 1, verse 4. The Judean churches also were the first authentic churches planted by Paul. Why is that important? Because they established the standard. Now, did the Thessalonians know the people from the churches in Judea or the church in Jerusalem that was planted? No. But yet, they looked the same. Now, how could you have that continuity? How could you have the same when you have complete separation of culture? Well, as Paul says, they received and accepted the Word of God, which became a work in them Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Two greatest commandments. If we do that, if we just obey that, we'll have continuity among the churches throughout the world as long as they obey that. But what has happened? People get away from this, the Word of God, and they allow philosophy to become a work in them. They allow the latest and the greatest ideas become a work in them. And they don't imitate the Bible, the Word of God. They looked all alike, (coughs) even though they had different cultures. You see, the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope that's mentioned in chapter 1 became a theme throughout the early church. And it's throughout the New Testament. They all had something in common, and it was Christ. It was the Word of God that began a good work in them. Now, Paul also points out, not only did they become imitators by their love and their labor and their hope, but they became imitators, again, by not shrinking back when persecution broke out. And they suffered. They suffered attack from their own people. And Paul compares it. He says, you received you know, persecution and attack from your own countrymen, just like the Jews did in Judea and Jerusalem from their own fellow Jews. Why? Because Satan opposes all mankind. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what culture you're from. Doesn't matter where you are on earth. Satan opposes all mankind. And he certainly opposes this message. He certainly opposes the gospel of God and he certainly opposes the work of God in your lives. So he will cause persecution. He will cause opposition. As we said a couple of weeks ago, Paul 
mentioned this conflict, this arena. The Greek word was an arena that conflict goes on, like gladiators. You've got to get it in your minds, folks, that you are in that arena, whether you like it or not, whether it's passive and you're just allowing the devil to beat you up and down the arena, you're not even fighting back because you don't even know you're in a fight, or you just give up. You don't even try. You name the name of Christ, but yet there's no work in you. What would happen if Paul wrote a letter to God thanking God for the work done in you? What would he say? I thank God for what? What would he say? I can't answer that question. I can tell you a lot of good things I see in this church. But I want you to answer it personally. Personally. What do you thank God for in the pattern that he has established in your life? Now, Here he goes on and says, You suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from their countrymen, both did from the Jews. Verse 15. Who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God opposing all mankind. The reason why he's mentioning Jesus' death and the prophets is because the common theme of Satan always coming up against the message of God through Jesus with the gospel, through the prophets trying to preach through to, to ancient Israel. They all suffered the same death. Murdered. Most of the time by their own family. By hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Saved by what? The message of the gospel. So, as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, that points to the fact that no one's getting away with nothing. Every single foul word, word of, uh, as Jesus said, each, um, oh man, I can't remember the exact word he said, but he basically was like, each careless thought or careless word that you ravel against your brother will be brought into judgment. Remember that. It's not just what you do. It's what you say, what you think. But the wrath has come upon them at last. But the wrath has come upon them at last. What, what's Paul saying there? Well, there's some debate about it. Some say, well, what Paul is saying is that he's pointing to the future, 70 AD, which would be about 20 years after this, when the Roman army would come into Jerusalem and surround it, and they would suffer. And as Jesus said, every stone within the temple would crumble. And that happened. 600,000 Jews died in a siege by General Titus and the Roman army. And Jerusalem and the nation of Israel from that moment on did not exist. From 70 AD until 1948, the nation of Israel did not exist. And it was reborn in 1948, fulfilling much prophecy. But that's for another sermon. So some have said that's what he's pointing to. Now, in the original language, it does mean... Wrath has come upon them at last. Where it says at last, it could say wrath has come upon them in the end. So the word could be translated the end. So what does that mean? Well, others are saying, well, that means that that judgment will come upon them at the end when God judges everyone. A third view would be this, is that the gospel has now, from the Jews' rejection of the Messiah has now gone off into the land of the Gentiles. God's doing a new thing. And God has now brought a hardening against the Jews, as it says in Romans chapter 11. They were hardened in partial. They could not see. They could not hear. Romans 11. So therefore, the gospel would now go out unto the Gentiles. I think that's more accurate. That now God is bringing both Jew and Gentile together, as Ephesians chapter 3 says, under one household. And this is a judgment upon the nation of Israel. That salvation through the Jews' Messiah. Remember Jesus said salvation comes through the Jews. The Jewish Messiah would now be the light even unto the Gentiles. This was a judgment against an unbelieving nation, Israel. This was demonstrating that only the remnant would be saved. For God, in his purpose of election, would come. For he loved Jacob and hated Esau. I think that's what he's saying. Is that the wrath has come upon them and will remain on them until a later date, as it says in Romans 11, all Israel will be saved. 
again, another sermon. So what do we get from all of this? What is some application that, that I want to leave you with? Well, first, first thing you've got to get, if, if you're going to advance in life as a Christian, you have to know this and believe it in faith. That the gospel message, that message I told you of Christ, where he came from, what he did, where he went, and what he's going to do, the gospel of God is power. It's powerful. You've got to trust in that. If you don't trust in that, you'll begin to trust in your own self. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Are you ashamed of the gospel? I can, I can help you answer that question. When's the last time you shared it with someone? Are you ashamed of this powerful message? Is there any other message for salvation? A whole dying world out there. Is there any other message for them? When's the last time you shared it with someone? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. He didn't say, it's my eloquent speech, my learning, my education, the fact I'm a Pharisee, and I know the Old Testament, memorized by heart, that's what persuades people to Christ. No, I aimed to know nothing among you other than Christ and Him crucified. So, number one, the gospel is powerful. Don't be ashamed of it. You don't have to fluff it up. You don't have to put blinking lights on it. You don't have to put sparkles on it. You don't need a smoke machine. You don't need people to jump out of whatever. It's a simple message, and it's the message of God, and that is the only message. Do you believe that? Now, so, if we do believe that, and we're not ashamed of it, then we believe in faith that as we proclaim it, As Paul says, we came and we proclaimed the message to you and you received it as it was. Not the words of men, but the word of God. So when we do that, we believe it in faith. And God will use this divine message to awaken dead ears and grant life to dead bones. No other way. No other way. Number two, we must remember that salvation is the work of the Lord. It's not a work of Sean. It's not a work of the church. It's not a work of nothing but the Lord. Salvation is a work of the Lord. And sanctification, the next process that begins, is a work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the word of the cross, which is what? The gospel. For the word of the cross is foolishness. It is folly. It is laughable. So with Greek, it's laughable. It's funny. It's a joke. For the word of the cross, the gospel is a joke to those who are perishing. Does it not say that in your Bible? 1 Corinthians 1.18 So one, we know there's power in the gospel. Two, we have faith that it is what causes salvation to come upon the home and the soul of man or their household. But we must also understand that it's a joke to those who are perishing. It's foolishness, it says. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. What does this mean? How do we pull it together? When you trust that it is the gospel that brings salvation. Then your hope is in that and not in your own selves to articulate it. It's not about your articulation. It's not about your apologetics, although it is good and you should know how to defend your faith. But one, just one thing I ask of you before you study all the apologetics in the world, please just get the gospel down. Get the gospel message down simply. Don't take away from it. Don't add to it and share it. You do that. 
And the work of God will bring salvation. Does that mean that everyone you talk to is going to be saved? No, that ain't what it means. But you go expecting. You go with an anticipation that just like God was faithful to Paul in Thessalonica, he'll be faithful to you at work or school or at home or your neighbors or wherever you share those seeds of grace. He will be faithful and you believe it in faith. Number three, discipleship. This is all a picture of how Paul made disciples in the first century. We have a beautiful example of what he did and how he did it. Discipleship begins with what? A willingness to let God use you. To let God use you. Do you have a willingness to let God use you? Because that's where it begins. God don't use stubborn mules. He didn't say, go into all the world because I'm going to drag you there and force you there. He said, go into all the world and make disciples and teach them to obey what I've taught you. Has Christ taught you anything? Answer me. Has Christ taught you anything? And if he has, then why haven't you taught others what he taught you? Maybe you are. Fantastic. Praise God. He's glorified. Keep doing it. I charge you. You know, it's like the football. Attaboy. Keep going. Don't stop. But if you haven't, why? Now, the Word of God does the work. If discipleship starts with a willingness to go and share and make disciples, and then believing that you're going with the divine tools, the gospel, the Word of God, He'll give you boldness. He'll give you boldness. You might not have it, and that's okay. We see that in the Bible. I see a man named Peter, a man named Cephas, who the night that Jesus is being crucified, hid like a little boy. And when a girl said to him, whoa, wait a minute, you're one of his disciples. He said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know that man. I don't know him. I've never seen him in my blankety blank blank life. It says he brought down curses. He, he cursed and said, I don't know that man. Like a little, little coward. I could be that coward. You could be that coward. But what happened when Jesus rose from the dead? He said, go into the city and wait for the power to come on high. That's what they did. They didn't know what was going to happen. These were fishermen. They waited. And the Holy Spirit of God came upon them with fire. And that very day, he stood up among those same crowd that crucified the Lord. Who knows, that girl may have been in that crowd. She probably was. And he stood up and he said the gospel. And he, ah, they were cut to the heart. And he said to Peter, how can we be saved? He said, repent all of you and be baptized into the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Unapologetically dogmatically, you who crucified him, you now go and be immersed in front of everybody under that name. He knew that was, that was going to cost his life. Ultimately, it did. This cowering coward later brought before men to be crucified. And he said, I just have one request. Please grant me this one request as you kill me and make an example of me. Crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified in the way of my Lord. Where'd that come from? You think he mustered that up? He read some, some 10 ways to be a better Christian book? came from dependence upon the power of Almighty God. That same boldness that he had, that same boldness that Paul says that he was given when he went to the Thessalonians, God gave us boldness. He'll give to you. You seek him, he'll give to you. Don't matter if you're you're just a child. It doesn't matter if you're an old grandpa or grandma. It don't matter. You're here, you got air in your lungs, you have a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify Christ. And it's going to look different. We're all going to look different. And that's, isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that sound like God? Look, my eyes are different than yours. And yours is different than hers. Your fingerprints, 
Not one human being in all the human race, billions of people have the same fingerprints or eyes. Isn't that awesome? God's unique handprint on each of us. And he's got a plan. He's got a purpose for you to fulfill. Just like he did Paul. Just like he did the Thessalonians. Look, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Read with me. Write it down. Memorize it. We have to get the word of God upon our hearts. What does it say? For the word of God is living and active. This is not some ancient thing that, oh, ancient philosophy. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing. You hear these words? Piercing to division of soul. And is there anything else in all creation that could do this? Piercing division of soul and spirit, joints and of the marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Look, as, as Charles Spurgeon said, you read the Word of God, the Word of God starts reading you. The Word of God will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from the Word of God. Why? Because it's alive, it's active, it's sharp, and it pierces, it convicts. Oh, does it ever to me. I was wrestling with this one driving down the road yesterday. God, when bullies come and they, you know, want to rough you up, that makes me angry, God. I don't like bullies. As a kid, you know, being short, freckled face and having a name, Dittman, I'm sure you can assume, you know, you can change the wording of that. You know, I didn't like being picked on. And so it, wasn't, it wasn't, didn't take much for a couple of words before someone ended up with a fat lip. I may end up losing the fight, but they're going to walk away with a limp. They're going to have some blood coming off them somehow. I'm going to fight back. And I said, God, I don't, God, for Jesus, why do you have to say if someone hits you on the right cheek, give them your left? How am I supposed to teach that to Javen, my little short mini me? Who goes to school with freckles on his face too. Just like me. It ain't easy. But the word of God stands true. I either submit and obey or not. I'm not saying the message is easy. I'm not saying that. But it's, it's either I, I read it and say, oh man, this is just a suggestion. This is the words of man here. Or I receive it as it is the word of God. Now, I have some questions for you. Do you have confidence in God and His Word? Can't answer it for you. Do you have confidence in God and His Word? Then why don't you witness every day? Are you a light on a hill? Or do you put it under a basket? These verses show us an aerial view of true conversion, what it looks like. You have a pagan people, don't know the Lord. The message of the gospel comes through Paul and the other missionaries, Timothy and Silas. And they come with full conviction to repent, turn from their idols to serve the living God. Became imitators of the churches. They all looked alike. Why? Because they had the common theme of the Holy Spirit and His Word. They received it dearly, became familiarized with it, and their life was an example to the others around everywhere, it says. So what? This should be a pattern that we should also model. We should model this. We should be going and sharing the gospel, as Jesus said, share with every creature, every single creature. And then God does His work. Do you accept the Word of God as it is, the Word of God, or the words of men? Do you see change in your life? Can you point? Can you point to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? The work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you point back to it and say, look what God has done? Not what I've done. Look what God has done. Your pattern of prayer. Can you answer this question? 
What does your pattern of prayer look like? We know what Paul's pattern was. Continual. Never ceasing. Thankfulness. We ask God for boldness. Boom. Boldness. So we've got an example. We know, we know Jesus' example. Look, there was nobody in all history more busy than Jesus from Nazareth. For those three years, that man was busy. Why? Because word got out like, oh, he can cure cancer. He can uh, raise the dead. You, you don't think people were calling him? Ringing his doorbell? Chasing him? Crowds followed him. It says if all, everything he did was putting in books, there ain't enough library space in all creation to hold it. But yet, he was in prayer more than anybody. So don't tell me, oh, I'm too busy, or I pray as my day goes. Is that what we have? Is that what Paul said? I pray as I'm driving to work. So I ask, what is your pattern of prayer? How much time have you spent thanking God? This, was, this hit me home. I, I'm always asking God. I'm asking God to do this, to do that, to do this, to do that, please this, please that, make this happen, that happen. But how much time am I thanking God? Maybe that's why sometimes I have a heavy heart. Because the devil is helping me to be confused about some things. So I ask you, do you pray for opportunities to share the gospel? Yes or no? These are simple questions. Do you pray for opportunities to share the message of Christ with others? Yes or no? And then, do you share when God gives the opportunity Going forward, going forward, I got you some points I want you to ask God this week. I want you to ask God to increase your faith and confidence in His Word. Start there. I want you to ask God to give you a willingness to make disciples. Some of us have been Christians for many years, but yet we have no disciple, discipleship in our tree. So ask God. To give you boldness to walk along someone. That's what discipleship is. It's not just giving them information. It's not just telling people that, you know, answer the blanks as, I, as we walk through this little booklet. No, it's coming along and walking with someone. Some of y'all watch that movie, uh, golly, what is it? Prayer Room. What's it called? War Room. That's a, that is a picture of discipleship. Now, I want you to ask God to make you a disciple maker. Why? Because that's his command. Matthew 28, go and make disciples. So ask God to make you a disciple maker. Ask God to help you to put your light on a hill for all to see and remove it from the basket. Ask God to give you an unshakable hope even in the face of trials and persecution. Don't be one of these who shrink back when you're persecuted. As I taught you a few weeks ago, if you aim to live like Christ, you will be persecuted. Ask God to help you become an imitator of Paul and the first century of Christians as they modeled Christ. Ask God to provide for you an urgency of the time, remembering that time is running out. And that the wrath of God remains on those who have not bowed a knee to Christ. Ask God for these things. You cannot do it on your own. You can't change on your own. You can't have a New Year's resolution on your own. There's only certain ingredients that bring about change. And those ingredients are the Holy Spirit spiritually discerning the things of God through His Word. Your humility, as the Word of God says, the people that God is searching for is those who worship Him in spirit and truth, who have a humble and contrite heart, trembling at His Word. So I charge you, go therefore and warn, warn every creature of the coming judgment and invite them all to the wedding supper of the Lamb, 
save them, be part of saving them from the righteous, holy flame of God's wrath that will come upon them, everyone, as it says in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, verse 8. For the swindlers, the deceivers, the cowards, the homosexual, the adulterers, and all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. You've been given a message of hope, a message of salvation. Don't put it under a basket. So I charge you, go therefore and tell everybody, everybody about this Christ. Believing in faith that He will produce the results. Let's pray.